Good uh, day, everyone, and welcome to the May 18th, 2022 edition of the Med Safety Exchange. And thank you for joining us. We know these are still pandemic times. We know you're very busy, and we really appreciate the time you spend with us and having you in the audience. My name is Mike Hamilton, and I'm Medical Director at ISMP Canada. This webinar is a production of ICMP Canada and CMERPS uh, with con contributions from all our partners in medication safety and you, the audience, and patients and families and caregivers. We host this webinar to help encourage reporting, sharing, learning of medication incidents and medication safety topics. Uh, we feel we learn best from each other, and we really appreciate the generosity of our presenters in sharing their expertise and their experience. And we hope that you can use this information presented in the webinar in your own organizations, and in turn, share your experience with uh, others. The Med Safety Exchange is presented on the Zoom webinar platform. A few reminders I think will help you um, ensure your computer audio is sufficiently loud. Audience members are automatically uh, muted and you won't allot, you will not show up on camera. And the presentation part of this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website in about two weeks or so. To submit questions, find the Zoom toolbar often at the top or bottom of your screen and you'll find a number of options. Um, use the Q&A tool and a window will open up. Feel free to submit any questions you like via that tool and you have the option to submit anonymously if you so wish. Your question or comment will go to the presenters and they will answer as they can um, via the Q&A panel. Responses will appear in the Q&A panel and questions will only appear in the panel once they are answered. And if anything we don't get to or any follow-up you'd like, please email us at medsafetyexchange at icpcanada.ca for any questions we don't get to. We'll try to answer them offline. We have a great lineup today and really covers a, a wide range of topics. First, we'll hear about what might be an underappreciated risk of very commonly used therapeutics and some system-based approaches to help mitigate that harm. And secondly, as we continue our progression into delivering more virtual care, we'll begin to get a sense of the challenges and risks and strategies in providing safe care from a distance. And after that, we'll learn about the updated medication safety self-assessment for community pharmacy. And finally, we'll listen to some updates from the analysis team. So I'd like to turn it over um, to a, a first presenter um, to uh, tell us about a medication incident uh, analysis. Thank you very much, Mike. And hello, everyone. My name is Rajiv Ramprasad, and I'm a medication safety specialist at ISMP Canada. And today I will be presenting key findings from a medication related death investigation. As part of its mandate, ISMP Canada participates in medication incident investigations across Canada. ISMP Canada's role during these investigations focuses on incident analysis, as well as identification of strategies to prevent recurrence of similar errors and promotion of safe medication practices. In this presentation, we will review the key findings from a death investigation involving an overdose of the drug acetaminophen. Acetaminophen is ubiquitous and commonly used to manage symptoms such as fever and pain. However, as we'll see through this investigation, too much of it can be detrimental to the liver, leading to toxicity. Next slide, please. Before we look at the investigation, we wanted to share some background on acetaminophen itself. Acetaminophen is a widely used analgesic due to its reputable safety and efficacy at therapeutic doses. Most healthy adults should consume no more than four grams of acetaminophen per day. However, its inclusion in a large variety of over-the-counter products, such as cough and cold medications, makes patients susceptible to overdose when using more than one of these medications. Patients may also combine these over-the-counter products with a prescription product containing acetaminophen thereby creating a risk of overdose. And acetaminophen in doses greater than 7.5 grams per day can cause hepatotoxicity. In fact, it was noted that acetaminophen overdose is the leading cause of acute liver failure in both the United States and Canada. And these cases can result in permanent liver injury as well as transplants and even death as we'll see in this investigation. 
Next slide, please. So in terms of background information, this medication incident took place in the hospital setting. Following successful surgery, the patient succumbed to acute liver failure due to acetaminophen toxicity. The patient's family denied any evidence of accidental or intentional overdose before hospital admission. The question of pre-admission overdose was also ruled out by the timeline of clinical presentation, which indicated that the patient's liver failure presented after the expected recovery period for a pre-admission overdose. For over two days, the patient received acetaminophen doses above the recommended daily maximum of four grams per day. In addition to their clinical presentation, a review of the laboratory findings were consistent with acetaminophen overdose. This included elevated liver function tests, as well as increased lactate levels, which were indicative of hepatic injury, as well as organ hypoperfusion. Next slide, please. So the next question we wanted to know was what factors contributed to this overdose? While many factors were likely at play, we noted three key findings. The first was that two different prescribers entered acetaminophen orders pre and post surgery. A pre-op order of acetaminophen was carried over to the post-op period, in addition to the new post-op orders of acetaminophen. In other words, there were duplicate orders for acetaminophen for this patient. Based on the information that was available to the review team, it was unknown if the hospital's computerized prescriber order entry system, or CPOE, presented active duplicate therapy alerts. Also, while it is typical for hospitals with CPOE to have a pharmacist to review the medication orders, it is unknown if a pharmacist reviewed and validated all medication orders in this hospital. Next slide, please. A second key finding relates to the fact that some nurses identified the duplicate orders for acetaminophen and did not administer additional doses. However, there was no documentation to support whether the error was brought to the attention of a physician, pharmacist, or other nurses. As a result, it was surmised that the error went unnoticed by other nursing staff who administered acetaminophen for both orders within short intervals. Next slide, please. The third key finding relates to the use of electronic medication administration records, or EMARs, by the hospital. While EMARs may provide greater accuracy and efficiency compared to manual processes, it's worth noting that it was unclear whether the hospital system could identify duplicate therapy or excessive doses. Next slide, please. So in addition to this investigation, we noted that acetaminophen overdoses have occurred elsewhere, and we wanted to share some examples of that. The Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch in the United Kingdom reported on unintentional acetaminophen overdose in hospitalized adults weighing less than 50 kilograms. The report describes a reference event of an elderly woman with low body weight who received acetaminophen dose at one gram four times a day for 20 days. While her dose was within the allowable maximum daily dose for most healthy adults, an adjustment was necessary due to her low body weight. And it was noted that there is currently no evidence-based consensus on adjusting the maximum daily dose based on weight for adults. And following an investigation of the reference event, the following safety observations were made. One is that it may be beneficial for electronic prescribing and medication administration systems to include an alert for oral acetaminophen that prompts documentation of a patient's weight and consideration of the risk of liver toxicity when the weight is below 50 kilograms. Also, it may be beneficial for the evidence on oral acetaminophen and low body weight to be reviewed by the relevant national bodies to reach a standardized prescribing guidance. And it may be beneficial for available technological solutions, such as beds with built-in scales, to be used to weigh patients. It was noted, however, that the cost of such equipment makes its widespread adoption challenging. Next slide, please. So in addition to the previous reports following acetaminophen overdose in hospital, it's well established that our current safety measures for preventing overdose in the community are also ineffective. Following an increased proportion of acetaminophen-related injuries from accidental overdose in Canada, new label standards were included in Health Canada's food and drug regulations. In 2009, standards were modified to require increased warnings about the potentially fatal risk of liver injury with acetaminophen overdose. After implementation of this standard, 
acetaminophen overdoses continue to rise. And so in 2016, further updates were made to facilitate product identification and communicate safe dosing. To determine if these new standards were effective in preventing hospital admission for acetaminophen overdose, a population-based study in nine Canadian provinces and three Canadian territories was conducted between April 1, 2004 and March 31, 2020. The results were that changes to acetaminophen product labels had no impact on ICU or hospital admissions for accidental acetaminophen overdose, as, as well as admission for acetaminophen overdoses involving opioids. So this reinforces that labeling is not enough to mitigate harm on its own, but rather we need a broad range of interventions throughout the medication use process. Next slide, please. So following the identification of these key findings, the review team developed the following recommendations. One is that a systems-based strategy could have, prevent, could have been implemented where all preoperative orders are automatically canceled during the perioperative period. As a result, new medication orders would have to be prescribed postoperatively. This could have prevented the administration of acetaminophen from, from the duplicate orders as well. Another recommendation involves standardizing the medication reconciliation process on admission and at transitions of care, including postoperatively to identify duplicate orders. This could involve using a standardized checklist to ensure that duplicate orders are accounted for. Next slide, please. And given the use of technology in the hospital where this incident took place, the review team also identified opportunities related to the software used to verify medication orders. One suggestion is to optimize alerts within the CPOE and pharmacy software to capture and flag duplicate orders and excessive doses. This would alert healthcare providers of concerns in dosing and where possible action is needed. And given that there were gaps in communication, one recommendation is to immediately communicate any medication concerns, such as duplicate orders to the prescriber or a pharmacist for resolution, regardless of when the issue was identified. Timely communication allows for timely intervention. In this case, communication of the duplicate acetaminophen order could have led to cancellation of the pre-op order, which could have avoided subsequent administration of extra acetaminophen. And another suggestion is specific to acetaminophen and involves displaying maximum daily recommended doses of acetaminophen, such as in the CPOE or on the electronic MAR. As part of this recommendation, EMAR technology would be leveraged to calculate the 24-hour acetaminophen intake from all sources, such as in combination products and any as-needed orders. Next slide, please. So in summary, despite acetaminophen's low perceived risk, its narrow therapeutic window and wide availability contribute to the risk of accidental overdose, which can be lethal. What doesn't look like a lot of acetaminophen can do a lot of damage in a short period of time. Without robust processes or checking procedures, duplicate or overlapping orders can be mistakenly transmitted through trans transitions of care, which increases the potential for medication errors. And recommendations for preventing accidental acetaminophen overdoses are multimodal and include standardizing communication, such as through notification of duplicate orders, as well as optimizing electronic prescribing and medication administration systems. Next slide, please. So this investigation integrated the following references, including an ISMP Canada safety bulletin on preventing harm through the safe use of acetaminophen. And we appreciate the opportunity to share the key findings, recommendations, and overall learning from this investigation. Thank you for listening, and I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. Thank you so much, uh, Rajiv. Um, I think some of the takeaway points for this um, include the fact it's been, you know, acetaminophen has been around forever. Um, often, you know, we use it ourselves, uh, in our home, in our, in our kids. Um, we often dismiss the risks of acetaminophen, probably at least in part because it's so ubiquitous. Um, but we need to continue to recognize that it, like other drugs, carries uh, risks of harm. And as well, because it's everywhere on many orders, it's probably on a, a number of duplicate pre-printed order sets and protocols that you, you have, um, or it's in, in combination with other products. It, it's really hard to keep track of and thus uh, is really easily duplicated. So, as part of the exercise um, for you is, is to identify the sources of acetaminophen in your organization. 
um, what are the isolated uh, acetaminophen products you have or the combination products? And in some cases, um, they go by different names. And what are the risks of the duplicate therapies? Um, is it the order sets, the four or five order sets that a patient might sort of have as they travel through an organization? Um, is it different naming con conventions for your acetaminophen products? And interestingly, and we'd certainly appreciate feedback on this, are your information systems, are they able to flag duplications um, or are they able to keep track of the cumulative doses of acetaminophen, um, which seems to be uh, a, a significant source of error, a significant risk of error here. So thank you very much, uh, Rajiv, for that. Our next uh, uh, topic is a um, sort of reflective of the new reality of uh, virtual care. So I'll hand it over to our speaker. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, hello, and thank you all for joining. My name is Melissa Sheldrick, and I am the patient and family advisor at ISMP Canada and was the project lead on a, uh, some work that we did uh, recently. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about this work that we undertook at ISMP Canada with, some, with the support of Healthcare Excellence Canada to look into medication safety in virtual care focusing in the primary care environment. So family doctors, nurse practitioners, community pharmacists, et cetera. We know there's been a rapid uptake of virtual care during the course of the pandemic, as many healthcare providers shifted quickly to video and phone appointments instead of having patients travel to their offices. And it has been said that virtual care is here to stay, which really prompted us to wonder what medication related problems have patients and prescribers encountered during virtual care and where are the opportunities for improvement? So to begin this work, we developed a plan to look at the literature to examine and analyze medication incidents that have been reported and to hear from patients and prescribers who have direct experience in virtual care. Next slide, please. The first course of action that we took was to look at the literature from the past three years. The COVID-19 pandemic was a catalyst for exponential growth and innovation for virtual health care. And so there was uh, quite an increase in publications from 2018 to 2021 when the search concluded. Many decision makers and clinicians sought clarity on uh, true clinical and cost effectiveness of these modalities, as well as patient safety aspects and virtual healthcare's impact on specific populations. This search uh, provided us with a high level summary on the state of research and documented experiences on a number of virt virtual healthcare considerations with a medication safety focus and the question, how has virtual care healthcare impacted medication safety practices? Two of the main points with regards to medication safety that came from the literature search were that remote monitoring was facilitated through the use of virtual care mechanisms. Virtual care was reported to be viewed as a relatively safe way for patients to interact with their primary care provider, including remote monitoring of medications, for example, anticoagulation clinics. Also, medication reconciliation routine processes were easily and efficiently managed virtually with fewer missed appointments with patients. Most articles in the literature search demonstrated that virtual care added to patient safety during the pandemic as well as supported medication management and reconciliation processes. It was also made clear though that not all medication care requirements for patients could be safely managed by virtual visits alone. Next slide, please. A multi-incident analysis was undertaken to examine what kinds of incidents were occurring in the virtual primary care space. Medication incident reports related to virtual care in the community were identified from three ISMP Canada databases, Individual Practitioner Reporting, Consumer Reporting, and the National Incident Data Repository for Community Pharmacies. From January 2020 to March 2022, and 4,682 reports were, re were retrieved. After the data extraction and the refining stage, a total of 58 incidents met the criteria for a multi-incident analysis. This analysis of a cluster of incidents in identified key areas of vulnerability, vulnerability that are shown in this, in this image. While these areas may not be unique to virtual care, they are likely to happen when healthcare is provided remotely. 
The first key area is during telephone and video appointments. There are gaps in assessment which are leading to medication incidents and there are errors coming through that are connected to a lack of an updated medication list. The second area of vulnerability is during the, is during the pre prescription transmis transmission stage when the prescriber is sending the prescription to the pharmacy. Incident reports show that sometimes the pharmacy does not receive the prescription. There are reports of unclear verbal and unclear faxed orders and the patients report feeling uninformed about the location and progress of their medications. Furthermore, the incidents show that patients who reported this type of incident faced a delay in their treatment plan. The third key area where incidents are being identified are during prescription delivery. Many people relied on delivery throughout the pandemic to avoid going into the pharmacy and reports received were around inadequate patient information and wrong address. One case reported that a medication was delivered to the wrong person and by the time it was caught and they retrieved it from the other patient, there was medication missing from the vial. Incidents continue to be reported to ISMP Canada. We continue to receive medication error reports that are consistent with these three areas of vulnerabilities. We would encourage all of you to report your incidents as well to ISMP Canada. One example of a recommendation that stemmed from the findings of the report is for providers to consider implementing a virtual uh, waiting room where a nurse or a pharmacist can complete a best possible medication history of BPMH just prior to the virtual appointment. This would result in a time savings during the actual appointment as the provider would have the up-to-date information on hand. An ISMP Canada Safety Bulletin will be published in the coming months with the full analysis and findings. Next slide, please. In order for us to hear directly from patients and prescribers, we put together a pan-Canadian advisory panel that included several patient re representatives who had experienced virtual care and a variety of frontline providers and national association representatives. Participants were engaged in three sessions with focus on the question, how can we ensure medication safety is attended to in the virtual care environment with a focus on primary care? The panel engaged in a co-design event which saw the team come together to understand and define the problem and then decide where the focus should lie and how to achieve a solution. As the panel was working through this process, a journey map was created. This type of chart lays out the journey that patients and providers experience as they're going through the virtual care process. We were very deliberate in remaining focused on medication safety as virtual care is a broad topic. The journey map outlined four stages of the experience before the appointment, during the appointment, the transmission of the prescription from prescriber to pharmacy and the patient receipt of the medication. Then together we identified actions, emotions and where the problems with medications arise at each stage. Since the patient representatives were those that had lived experience of traveling this journey, they were able to identify with all three of those aspects in each stage of the journey. The same can be said for the frontline providers. This process gave us an overall big picture of the entire experience. Then with feedback from multiple stakeholders, including agreement from the panel, opportunities for improvement were identified for each problem. This slide shows one example of a problem and opportunity from both perspectives. For the patient, they report not being able to retain all of the pertinent information about the medication they have been prescribed, such as the name, indication, dose, etc. An opportunity to address this would be to provide the patient and or the caregiver with a written summary of all the medications. From the prescriber's perspective, one problem that was identified was that it was quite time consuming to do the best possible medication history and a medication reconciliation during the course of the appointment. The opportunity here could be to optimize the role of the pharmacist to support the provider with doing the BPMH and MedRec before the virtual visit begins. Next slide, please. Some of the ways that ISMP Canada can support the knowledge translation for this work are presented here. A coordinated release of three products will be shared with stakeholders and Canadians broadly. 
a consumer newsletter outlining tips for patients before, during and after a virtual appointment, an ISMP Canada safety bulletin for providers that highlights the information gleaned from the multi-incident analysis, and an infographic to illustrate some of the problems and opportunities to address them to increase medication safety practices in virtual care. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Well, we have identified some potential areas of future work and you'll see that increased technology and accessibility in use seems to be a key tool to support improvement in medication safety. One idea is to work with primary healthcare teams to co-design supports for providers and staff to use with their patients during virtual care visits where medications are present. Another idea is to support the adoption of the transition to e-prescribing and broader digital health information by April 1st, 2023, which is based on a recommendation from a report by Will Falk to Health Canada. Thirdly, to raise awareness of opportunities to continue to improve communication to patients about the progress of their prescription and also to support a written medication summary to patients after every virtual care appointment when requested by or on behalf of a patient. There is momentum and opportunity to continue to examine improvements in the ever evolving virtual care environment and to increase medication safety for patients. It's through a multi-pronged approach to collaboration and co-design that we can continue to support and sustain this innovative method of healthcare delivery medication safety, and overall patient safety in virtual primary care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. Um, I think we all work in different sectors. Um, we all maybe work in different roles, but I think we've all in, been impacted by virtual care and it's really um, sort of been accelerating uh, these past few months, particularly as you mentioned, spurred on by the uh, pandemic. So with the rapid adoption of these remote services, um, all of us really are attempting to understand how remote healthcare is best used and where the vulnerabilities lie. And our, our role as medication safety enthusiasts is to gather the intelligence um, and, and listen to the stories and experiences of those involved and identify the vulnerabilities and maybe what we can do to make the remote care uh, safer. So I encourage you to do this uh, own reflection in your own practices. And by doing that, you might think about what sort of remote services your organization provides. Uh, might it be prescribing? Might it be some type of uh, receiving of uh, e-prescribing uh, system? Might it be preoperative -op pre clinics that are delivered remotely where medications might be changed? And related to that, what are the medication-related risks in your virtual processes? Certainly, um, MedRAC, BPMH, uh, all these factors are present. But what about remote patient identification? Are you sure you're talking to the right person? Are you sure you have the correct chart open for who's in front of you? Are the checking processes that you've built up in your system, are they still effective in a virtual world? So uh, very interesting questions and we'll learn more as we go along and we'll rely on you uh, as reporters and learners to, to help us with this. So I'll, I'd like to welcome our next speaker who will speak to us uh, about uh, the uh, community pharmacy sector and uh, a, just a terrific, I think, uh, self-assessment tool. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie Greenall, and uh, I, until recently, was Senior Director of Projects and Consultations at ISP Canada and uh, led this project to update the Community Pharmacy MSSA. I'm now transitioning to a consultant role. So um, our new assessment was launched in March of this year in both English and French, and this does replace the previous 2006 version. It also includes content from the MSSA Focus on Never Events in Community Pharmacy, which was developed and released in spring of 2021 with support from the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, uh, now Healthcare Excellence Canada. And for those not familiar with this terminology, a never event is a situation known to have previously caused harm to patients for which safeguards are available. And the never events MSSA content focuses on higher risk processes in pharmacies and strategies to avoid such events. And could I have the next slide, please? 
For those of you who have previously used our uh, MSSA, the 2006 version, uh, don't worry, your data is still accessible and we have included a cross-reference table so that you can see which items have similar content in the new MSSA. Next slide, please. Uh, when we were developing this uh, new updated MSSA for community pharmacy, uh, we had a wonderful pan-Canadian advisory panel that included patient and family representation, in addition to frontline and management pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, pharmacy regulatory authorities, academic institutions, a national pharmacy association, and a prescriber. And you can see on this slide that we truly had representation from uh, around the country, um, with the exception of the territories who were unfortunately not able to participate uh, in the process. Um, the uh, new MSSA, we have changed the format. So for those of you who have used it before, you'll notice that we've moved away from the, the previous 10 key elements format. And the new content sections were developed were determined based on themes from analysis of recommendations that ISB Canada had made in safety assessments of community pharmacies, which we've been undertaking over the last eight years. And there was a separate analysis of that content published in a safety bulletin in 2021, which there's a link for on this slide if you're interested in learning more about those. So the new assessment has seven sections, uh, which we've listed here. So beginning with patient engagement and partnership, medication storage and handling, use of technology and devices, uh, quality assurance and continuous improvement, addressing known areas of risk, uh, selected clinical situations, and high alert medications. There are a total of 116 assessment items in the assessment. Um, this is an increase from the previous MSSA for this sector, but we did delete a third of the old assessment items to make room for new content. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the new content includes items from the Never Events MSSA published last year, as well as emergency, emerging areas of risk, such as vaccine administration. We also changed the scoring algorithm. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, and just you'll notice that this is different from previously to really make it a little bit simpler and focus on the frequency with which each practice is followed. And there is a not applicable choice for uh, some items. And just an example, if your pharmacy doesn't provide opioid agonist treatment, you wouldn't be able to answer any questions about it. And these items will not contribute to your overall score. The section that was previously named demographics has been changed to pharmacy characteristics. And uh, we did include some new detailed questions about the services provided by responding pharmacies. And anything that's in the pharmacy characteristics section can be used as a, um, as a graphing filter when you're looking at your data. So it does provide more information about uh, to us about the types of services that pharmacies are providing, but also more comparative data for pharmacies that have completed the assessment. Next slide, please. So on the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna highlight some of the new format and content. And this slide shows the first two assessment items in the new patient engagement and partnership section. And we decided to put patient engagement and partnership at the front of the assessment, really to reflect the importance of working together with our patients to support the best possible therapeutic outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. On this slide, I've just listed the uh, what we call the core characteristics sections um, from the uh, area, the section that we called addressing known areas of risk. And so this covers uh, opiate agonist therapy, compliance packaging, compounding, and vaccines, and really includes specific safety strategies in these areas that uh, we hope will be helpful to pharmacies as they're considering what the risks might be in their own practices. Uh, next slide, please. There's also a section on uh, uh, selected clinical situations. And so looking at transitions of care, which we know to be very high risk, um, pediatric medication safety and uh, pregnancy and medication safety. And we have also included an item related to breastfeeding in the pregnancy section. So trying to highlight, again, some of those clinical situations that pharmacists would encounter on a day-to-day -day basis where there might be elements of risk. I'm now just gonna tell you a little bit about the process for validating and testing the new assessment. Um, it was field tested by 13 pharmacies in four provinces, Alberta, uh, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, and Ontario. And there were cognitive interviews conducted with three of the pharmacists who completed the MSSA just to review the clarity, the content for clarity and relevance. And feedback from this testing was included in the final version. My next slide, please. 
Um, in the new assessment, we have uh, uh, included an embedded evaluation, and that just gives immediate feedback to ISMP Canada on, um, on the uh, content in the MSSA. And so we did have results from the field testing, and I've just shared a few of them here for interest. And so first of all, um, everybody always wants to know how long will it take to complete the assessment? And so you can see that uh, for the test sites, almost all of them were able to complete the assessment in one to two hours. We also asked the teams if they plan to take any action based on learning from the assessment, and eight said yes and five said maybe, which suggests that new learning was acquired through completion of this assessment. And when asked if they would recommend the assessment to a colleague in another pharmacy, 11 said yes, which we take as a very positive view. Next slide, please. Following the validation testing, the final draft version underwent a modified Delphi process to determine the final content for inclusion. The Delphi process and cognitive interviews were conducted by an independent group called the Accessing Centre for Expertise, which is affiliated with the University of Toronto. The Delphi process included three rounds. The first was an online survey of 116 items. This was followed by a live virtual meeting with review of 27 items with tabulated voting. The final round was an online survey of 10 items. All rounds used the same seven-point scale, which ranged from not at all important to include to very important to include. Overall, there was a high level of agreement on the content for inclusion, and a number of items were removed or modified following the Delphi. Some new content was also identified as missing and was included in the last round of voting. Sorry, could you just flip back to the Delphi slide? Thank you. Um, the Delphi process included the advisory panel as well as selected invited community pharmacy experts, and it was conducted over a short three-week period last winter with a very high participation rate. And Mark Dobro from the Accessing Centre for Expertise said he'd never actually seen such a high response rate to our survey, which is really just um, demonstrated the, the interest in the, the content that we were developing. And this Delphi process really is, is going to be, I think the process will take forward in new MSSAs. It was just uh, such a value process in terms of building consensus on what content to include. And just my last slide, uh, I'd just really like to thank everyone who supported this, the advisory panel and the other experts who supported the development process, the community pharmacy test sites, and Mark Dobro from the Accessing Center for Expertise. And we do really look forward to hearing from community pharmacies about their experience with this new MSSA. And I'd like to thank the Med Safety Exchange team for the opportunity to share this information with you today. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Julie. Um, we all know that most healthcare takes place in the community and, and uh, by far the most accessible healthcare provider is uh, community pharmacists. So um, very important work and very terrific. And we certainly uh, will pay attention as this moves along to see what else uh, we can learn, particularly as the role of community pharmacists are expanding. Um, so again, thank you so much. Thanks. In our next section, we will uh, climb on up into the observatory and uh, particularly uh, looking forward to the update from the ISMP Canada analysis team. Dorothy. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, my name is Dorothy Zen. I am the director of the Practitioner and Consumer Reporting and Learning Programs and part of the ISMP Canada multidisciplinary analysis team. So over the next few slides, um, I'm gonna share some information about a new presentation of a COVID-19 vaccine um, alongside some identified safety issues. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, early in the pandemic, we were still learning about the new COVID-19 vaccine. Um, while we are doing that, a safety bulletin highlighted some vulnerable steps of vaccine use processes. And that learning really was gleaned and based on previous analysis of errors related to all types of vaccines, not, not necessarily the COVID-19 vaccines, which were still just coming out at that point. And then as, as time progressed, hospitals and clinics and pharmacies, they started to share their experiences with these COVID-19 vaccines with us and through the reporting platforms of the Canadian Medication Incident Reporting and Prevention System or CMRMS as Mike has, was, had described earlier. And, and it's through these reports, we learned about the vulnerabilities in the system that led to the errors and we were able to share some strategies to address them. Next slide, please. And then the COVID-19 vaccines for children aged five to 11 years old, they became available in 2021. And 
most frequently we heard about stories about mix-ups of this particular vaccine and those intended for children and adults 12 years and older. But we also had the opportunity to learn about good stories from hospitals and pharmacies and clinics who identified novel strategies to address these types of errors. And we're really thankful to those who permitted us to share their learning to the wider healthcare community. So on this slide is an example of the use of color coding throughout both the vaccine use and the patient flow processes in order to match the pediatric COVID-19 vaccine to children aged five to 11. Next slide, please. So now the newest change in the COVID-19 vaccine landscape is the availability of a new presentation of a Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for individuals who are 12 years and older. So this slide is it's taken from um, the Pfizer website, uh, a, a good um, a chart on the Pfizer website. It shares the three available vaccines from that or that company. The one on the far right is the one in orange that you're familiar with, and that's for children aged five to 11. The one on the far left is in purple is for individuals 12 years and older. And the new presentation is the one in the middle, and it's also for those individuals 12 years and older. And the key difference is here between the the vaccines presented in purple and in gray are the recommended storage conditions, the preparation steps, the date labeled on the vials, and also the non-medicinal ingredients. Next slide, please, Mike. So um, this slide is just a it's just a picture of the comparison chart that you can find on the Pfizer website. Um, just please note that the differences in the non-medicinal ingredients, they're not captured in this particular chart. Next slide, please. So over the next few slides, um, we'll review together the differences between the vaccines intended for the 12 and older population and share a few strategies to consider. So the first one here is around storage. Storage is the first of two important steps in the vaccine use process. Vaccine preparation is another key process. And we were seeing a lot of errors reported to us because of the complexity of the processes at each of these steps. So if you take a look at the slide here, the product and gray labeling, um, just to highlight um, some, of the, some of the characteristics of the storage, recommended storage conditions, um, the, the new product or the new presentation is viable on ultra low temperature freezers until at least 12 months after the manufacture date on the label, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, it is not recommended to be stored in a freezer from temperatures uh, from mi minus 25 to minus 15 degrees Celsius. It is viable for longer in refrigerated and room temperature conditions, as well as after the first puncture, as compared to the product with the purple labeling. And so what we've learned is the product in gray will be available alongside the product in purple during a transition period. So this means that potentially those, you know, clinics and pharmacies and hospitals, you may have both products in stock at any given time. So anywhere the vaccine is going to be stored, we'll need strategies to adequately differentiate these two products. Next slide, please. The slide just highlights a few strategies that we've shared to differentiate the products. And they include using only one product where possible, so either the purple or the gray, and preferably not both. Um, we recognize that sometimes that's out of your control. Um, but also if you have both products on site, segregating them in different storage areas and labeling the vials to identify when products have moved from different storage conditions and providing signage throughout the storage areas to help support staff in maintaining proper storage conditions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Vaccine preparation and most specifically processes related to dilution of the vial contents, they were key steps that, and they are key steps actually, that are, are impacted by the introduction of this new gray labeled uh, vaccine. So unlike the product labeled in purple, this product does not require dilution. So that this is a key, key difference. It does not require dilution. Dilution was a step involved in a number of vaccine errors that were reported to us. So this new product simplifies the, the preparation process greatly, but its presence, this presence of the new gray label vaccine alongside the purple one can lead to incorrect preparation or mix-ups. 
So some of the key strategies here to avoid mix-ups between the products include limiting stock to one product where possible and segregating the preparation areas for each product with appropriate signage, again, to guide staff through the different preparation processes. Next slide, please. So this next slide describes the dates on the labels. So the dates stamped on the vial labels, they represent different dates. The date of the product, the date on the product in purple represents the expiry date. The date on the product in gray on the right side represents the manufacturer date. So we have to recognize that the dates represent different dates, the dates on the vials. I wasn't able to get a picture of the, um, the label with the date of the gray vial, but you see one here for the purple vial on the left. And so the date on the gray label product is similar to the date on the orange, which if you remember is for children aged five to 11. They both represent the manufacturer date and the expiry date of those two products is 12 months after the date on the vial. So you've got to wrap your head around this a little bit because the dates represent different, different, um, different dates. So take the opportunity to learn from how you've managed the expiry dates with the, the vaccines labeled in orange for, for children five to 11. And if those have been successful, consider applying them to this new product. Next slide, please. So this slide highlights some of the differences between the non-medicinal ingredients. Th these are two different formulations um, and the formulations allow for different storage conditions and allow, you know, allow for, for, um, for, for differences in, in the management of these two, two products. And so you see on, in the, on the right side, in the gray, with the gray product or the product labeled in gray, um, it contains tromethamine, which some patients are allergic to. So this is particularly important to recognize this difference and to ensure that you have a process to identify it and manage the patients who have this allergy. Next slide, please. And lastly, I, I just want to mention that, you know, every hospital, clinic, or pharmacy, they manage their vaccine processes slightly differently. And here's an opportunity with, with the presentation of this new um, vaccine to review these considerations alongside your own clinic setup and your own existing processes to best determine how to prevent mix-ups um, when you have both products on site. And as I had shared earlier, we've, you know, we've been enriched with stories from, from all, all, all practitioners, um, pharmacies, clinics, hospitals, and um, we've learned quite a bit over, over the pandemic about the vaccines. And we do really encourage you to share your experiences with this new vaccine presentation through your reporting systems, the ones that you have existing within your own organizations, um, many of which report into the CMRPS um, databases. And if you don't have um, a reporting platform or program program um, within your own organization, I do encourage you to report into the individual practitioner reporting platform of the CMRPS program. And um, the links, I think was actually, the link was actually shared in the chat a little bit earlier. So please do um, consider that and let's learn and strengthen vaccine use processes together. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Dorothy. Um... So today um, we've learned about acetaminophen, we learned about virtual care, about community pharmacy and about vaccines. So I really want to thank all our presenters um, for their you know, terrific sharing, terrific learning that they've shared today and their efforts towards improving patient care. Um, we also like to thank you, the audience, for learning along with us. Again, um, please let us know what you think uh, by contacting us. Um, or by completing the feedback poll or by reaching out in any other way. So we learn, I think, best uh, by stories and we learn uh, about medication safety from conversations about errors. And we learn about them from multiple perspectives, uh, the patient, the practitioner, and the system. Um, 
we want you to donate your experience and donate your stories in, in order to help us make care safer. So please uh, reach out to us if you have a great idea, if you've um, done something to improve the care of your patients, or you know, conversely, if uh, an error has happened or a mistake happened did you, and you think there's some learning to us. So we're always eager to hear, we're always gonna help you. Um, please uh, be a part of the Med Safety Exchange. So again, um, the link to this recording uh, will be available on the Med Safety Exchange website, along with some uh, pertinent links. And the PDF of the slides is available upon request to the email um, address on the slide, medsafetyexchange at icpcanada.ca. The next uh, webinar will be in September 2022. So please stay connected so we can let you know when the date is finalized. So please uh, reach out to us uh, at any time, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.